Lecture nine, actually 10, 11. This is the 11th lecture. Uh, gastrointestinal physiology and metabolism. We are one long tube parsing nutrients and filth from mouth to anus. One way to think of humanity. All right. So uh, my haiku there speaks to this long-held notion um, that, and I could go further back than uh, 1497, five years after Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, go, I could go back all the way to Ayurvedic um, understanding of the chakras and uh, the meaning of the chakras as you ascend uh, from the bottom up to the highest chakra is this notion that uh, the viscera, the stomach, the intestines uh, associated as they are with excrement are sort of lower organs uh, that are filthy and less uh, essential, less central to uh, our being and than other organs. That is a little bit uh, discriminatory against the poor gastrointestinal system that works so hard and in such complexity for us. Uh, here is Alessandro Benedetti in 1497 saying, quote, the stomach is the lowest and has a hidden place in the body because of its uncleanness as though nature had spared the principal members and had relegated the stomach or bowels farther away from the sight of reason and of the mind and fenced it off with the diaphragm in order not to disturb the rational part of the mind with its importunity. These members serve the higher ones. Some of them concoct the food into juice, others digest it into various humors, others expel the superfluity. Um, uh, Mr. Benedetti may be appalled uh, to learn about the modern uh, conventions of fecal replacement therapy and other such uh, studies into the importance of the microbiome and the flora that live both in our intestines and on the skin and everywhere else, um, hoping to live in a very clean and high-minded world. Da Vinci. Also, I, I included this one because I found it, found it kind of uh, funny. Everybody puts Da Vinci on a, on a pedestal. Um, but he, he had this funny insight into the stomach. Um, the digestive system aided the respiratory system in its function. Quote, the compressed intestines with the condensed air which is generated into them, a.k.a. farts, thrust the diaphragm upwards. The diaphragm compresses the lungs and then expresses the air. Um, talking about that. So da Vinci must have had quite a bit of, of gas uh, there, talking about the interplay between those. I thought that was amusing. Um, not two minutes ago while you were taking your quiz, I realized that I, I, I like the history of the GI tract. And so I went and quickly threw this story up uh, in, the, in the talk uh, because it's a really fascinating story. And uh, besides, I was born in Beaumont Hospital in Detroit, uh, named after this guy right here, William Beaumont. So it's something a little bit near and dear to my heart. Um, Mr. Beaumont, Dr. Beaumont, uh, was from Michigan, and on June 6th in 1822, there was uh, this guy named Alex St. Martin, who was a furrier that lived up on Mackinac Island, which is a little, uh, as a Michigander, I'll pull out my map. Here is the lower peninsula. Here is the upper peninsula. Mackinac Island's right about there. Um, so uh, he was a furrier out on Mackinac Island, um, who got shot in the gut. He took one uh, to the gut from a shotgun and uh, was full of buckshot. Didn't kill him, messed him up. Messed him up pretty good. Dr. Beaumont <laughs> saw this guy in what must have been some very rude hospital environs, uh, rude medical environs, and tried to stitch this guy up. Uh, but didn't do a very good job. Uh, in fact, 
what he did was accidentally, as he was sewing up Mr. St. Martin, uh, stitched the hole that had been blasted in his stomach to the skin on the outside of his body. So he was just stitching things together, trying to like close it up, probably a little bit uh, flustered at having to deal with so ghastly a wound in this guy's gut, and uh, probably didn't train at the caliber that hopefully all of you uh, will have trained at uh, by the time you're stitching people up or whatever you end up doing. So uh, this guy quite literally had a window into his stomach. There was, there was a flap that you could pull up and look inside this, this guy's stomach. So um, Mr. Beaumont, it says here, expected St. Martin to die from his injuries. Uh, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, and Mr. Beaumont became, Dr. Beaumont became fascinated with this, uh, this sort of fortuitous error in his uh, medical practice and got this guy, St. Martin, to follow him around wherever he went. He took him on his travels and began to kind of experiment with this guy by taking bits of food, tying strings to them, sticking them in the hole, in the window, into this guy's stomach, letting them uh, digest for a little bit, and then yanking the food out and seeing what, what has happened to it after the food has been partially digested. Uh, as bizarre and grotesque as this sounds, it actually significantly advanced our understanding of the digestive process in the stomach and what kind of uh, secretions and the, and the timing of, of the whole digestive process. Uh, I can only imagine that it must have been a little bit disappointing to Mr. St. Martin after having a full belly to have it ignominiously removed on a string by uh, this guy here. So anyways, there's a bizarre story for you. Uh, the components of the digestive system. Do I really need to go through these? I think we've talked about these in uh, lab. But uh, I will quickly. So there's the oral cavity, uh, the salivary glands. They are both important uh, initial uh, portions of the digestive system. Uh, the pharynx through which the food passes into the esophagus, down to the stomach, uh, where we have chemical breakdown, uh, and then the food passes through the pylorus into the small intestine, where the liver, gallbladder, gallbladder and pancreas all contrive to add their uh, digestive enzymes uh, to the mix, uh, the, the chyme or... Uh, food and uh, digestive juices then passes its way through the small intestine where we have nutrient absorption and absorption of water. Uh, and finally, uh, it passes into the large intestine for dehydration and the bulk removal of fluid um, that had been dumped into the broken up uh, food material um, in the higher structures uh, and compaction for a eventual elimination from the body as feces. Okay. So, <clears throat> the concept of peristalsis. Peristalsis. Uh, we're going to talk about peristalsis in terms of swallowing. However, this uh, process of peristalsis works from stem to stern. Uh, it's, the, it's the fundamental way that your uh, digestive system has of physically moving material on down the line, as it were. Um, so we'll just talk about swallowing first. Uh, there is this buckle phase where um, buckle means cheek. We are using our cheeks to, uh, we're creating a negative pressure in the mouth, and uh, the cheeks are forcing the food towards the back of the oral cavity and transitioning from the oral cavity into uh, the pharynx. Uh, when that bolus of food enters the pharynx, it's pushing down on the epiglottis, closing that off uh, in, the, in the pharynx. The pharynx is contracting and uh, driving a bolus of food uh, in front of the contracting wave of smooth muscle in the back of the 
throat and the pharynx, uh, and then entering into passing the epiglottis and entering into the esophagus, uh, the esophagus for the esophageal phase. Uh, once it's it's there, we have these ripples of uh, contracting smooth muscle that as they contract, they're uh, contracting only on one side of the bolus of food and rippling along the length of uh, the esophagus and pushing the bolus of food in front of it and uh, down into the stomach. Um, and the same thing happens in the intestines. Um, I had a student ask me, should I talk about this? I'm probably not. But I had a student ask me once uh, about an episode of South Park uh, where in the episode they talk about um, <coughs> driving food in the reverse order through the digestive system and the peristalsis, uh, and they wanted to know whether that was even possible given the directionality of peristalsis here. In fact, it is. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have to report that it is possible uh, that peristalsis can work in either direction uh, depending upon how the GI tract is toned. It is the consistent motion of food in the, this unidirectional directional, uh manner through the GI tract that stimulates peristalsis to move uh, in, in the way that it, it, it does. <clears throat> so uh, this is hinting at a, a local control where po portions of the myenteric plexus are, uh, are stimulating adjacent portions of the myenteric, ple myenteric plexus and it not being under some sort of central control or higher, uh, higher order um, a sequential pattern that may be regulated by, for example, the, the cerebrum or, or what have you. All right, so here is a very generalized uh, pattern of regulation. All right, um, there are essentially three, uh, there, are, there are three different mechanisms for this uh, regulation in the digestive tract. The first being uh, neural mechanisms. Um, they, <coughs> uh, the, the feedback loop starts with stretch receptors in the mucosa of uh, whatever uh, portion of the GI tract we're interested in. Okay, so we have the stretch reflectors that send a very short reflex right to the myenteric plexus embedded uh, in the, the wall of uh, the, the lumen of the, of the structure. Um, that myenteric plexus is going to uh, potentiate a number of things, uh, peristalsis, uh, which we just described, which are these waves of the circular and longitudinal muscles. Um, it's, they can also stimulate the secretory cells in, uh, the, in the mucosal lining, and um, they can activate some of the enteroendocrine cells that are going to produce hormones that will uh, regulate um, the broad actions in the GI tract. This, the same stretch reflexors also have long reflex uh, fibers that can uh, go all the way up to the CNS, the central nervous system, and uh, also feed feedback into this myenteric plexus. That long reflex uh, is important, but is not as potent as the short reflex pattern um, uh, on the myenteric plexus. Um, the second uh, method is hormonal. Uh, various hormones that are going to help uh, guide the action of uh, various digestive activities and secretions. Um, and so that can be uh, right uh, through, and that can be through uh, the circulation uh, and its effects on these enteroendocrine cells. We'll talk about the different types of enteroendocrine cells and their function uh, in a few slides. And then finally, <coughs> there can be different local factors 
uh, that can also affect that. Uh, has the pH? What's the pH? Has the pH dropped uh, in the in the area? Uh, is there a physical stimulation um, of some sort or chemical stimulation? Like depending upon the contents, uh, the contents of the stomach are going to uh, the chemical makeup of uh, what's in the stomach is going to uh, help drive. Um, the secretory cells and other endocrine uh, mechanisms. All right. So, stomach first. Um, how do we? So, first of all, the acid. If I were to ask you, or not even you, just uh, the general person on the the um, street, what their stomach produces. How does your stomach work? What is it doing to break down food? what would the average individual probably say? Well, they'd say you make acid. Your stomach makes acid somehow, right? Uh, uh, the type of acid it makes is hydrochloric acid, a very potent uh, acid that uh, gives a pH in the stomach of less than one, um, which is an extremely strong acid. Um, how do we make that happen? Well, <clears throat> I told you that uh, one of the biggest uh, sources of acid in the body is, uh, comes from carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide is the cellular byproduct of metabolism, uh, and then carbonic anhydrase uh, is a uh, enzyme that we uh, met yesterday. Uh, oh no, two days ago in the respiratory chapter, we talked about carbonic anhydrase and how it takes uh, dissolved carbon dioxide, combines it with water, uh, and uh, forms carbonic acid. Uh, the carbonic acid then, so which is right here, uh, carbonic acid then dissociates into carbonate and, uh, and the hydronium ion, and we get this uh, alkaline tide, uh, this, this chloride shift coming here, and the alkaline tide, uh, where the, car the carbonate, so this is, uh, the, this is the conjugate base of this acid. An acid is a proton donor. Uh, the carbonic acid up here uh, is, uh, donates its proton, dissociates, so here's the, uh, the conjugate base. And uh, this negative charge gets exported. Uh, this, this acts as a base. This negative charge gets exported uh, to the, um, into the interstitium, which is eventually going to go to the bloodstream. And we get charge neutrality in an antiporter with, uh, by an exchange with um, the, the chloride. All right. So now the... the uh, the carbonate here uh, has been replaced by the chloride. And this here, uh, this carbonic acid is a weak acid, all right? But uh, H plus and Cl minus is a strong acid, all right? So this, this arrow is an equilibrium, right? The carbonic acid and the carbonate and the hydronium, that's an equilibrium going back and forth. As a weak acid, it goes back up that way pretty readily. But if you replace this uh, carbonate with the chloride, we have HCl. That's a strong acid, meaning that the uh, equilibrium between H plus and Cl minus going to HCl strongly favors dissociation because chloride likes to carry the negative charge. It's electronegative. It's a, it's, uh, it's a halogen on the far side of the uh, periodic table. It likes negative charge. Uh, carbonate doesn't like to be negative as much as chloride. So HCl is a very strong acid, uh, but we, we've created a strong acid, but there's, charge, there's a charge balance, right? Because we shifted, uh, we, we shifted uh, an anion out for an anion in, so there's, we haven't paid any energy for this. Um, and then this HCl gets exported uh, into the lumen of the stomach via these gastric glands. Was that too much chemistry for you guys? Do you follow that? Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, 
uh, I find it to be uh, very interesting. So uh, one of the one of the upshots of this is that uh, is anybody is anybody here a runner? Did anybody run in high school? Okay. Uh, when you ran those races, when you were running, did you ever run so hard at the end you were just like, Bleh. you barfed? Um, why does that happen? Why does that happen? What are we doing when we barf? We're removing acid from the body, right? We're removing acid from the body uh, and by dealing with all this carb, uh, CO2 that's building up in the, acid, in the body. This uh, method is one way of, of removing uh, carbonic acid and CO2 from the body really quickly. Okay? The lungs are not able to do it fast enough uh, and uh, the, your, your stomach, um, by vomiting, you're removing acid from the body and helping the respiratory system. Okay, here's the opening of a gastric pit. I just love these electron micrographs. Um, so, yeah, I just say here, gastric juice has a very high concentration of HCl. Uh, yeah, pH as low as 0 0.8, as I had said previously. Very, very acidic uh, environment in the stomach. All right, so let's talk about what happens uh, when we eat lunch. Did I say lunch? Okay, so <clears throat> the phases of gastric secretion, the cephalic phase. Ooh, that is a really nice looking tangerine. Hmm, hmm. It smells delicious. It smells delicious. You see that, that orange? It looks good. It smells great. You know what? I bet you it's going to taste good. So I'm sitting here thinking, oh, mmm about this orange as I peel it. The juice is spraying up into the ambient environment. Maybe, maybe you guys in the front are maybe beginning to catch the first whiff of this delicious looking tangerine here. Thinking about how juicy it's going to be. Oh man, what a nice mid-morning snack I'm about to have. Well, I'll just set it there and let you guys think about that. Um, I'm gonna take one. It's juicy. It's juicy. It tastes really good. It tastes good. I'm thinking about eating that whole thing. It's really good. What am I doing? This is all up here in my head. Central processes. Seeing it, smelling it, thinking about it, sticking it in my mouth, tasting it. The taste is all going up to my central nervous system. This is getting the brain tuned to the fact that Mm, it is time to get down on a snack. It's going to send uh, signals. Uh, so that's all afferent input into the brain, right? It's through the olfactory bulb, through the facial nerve, through the glossopharyngeal nerve, through the optic nerve. All these cranial nerves are sending uh, afferents into the central processing. We're thinking about it. The cortex is doing its business. It's sending signals down. For synapse in the brainstem, uh, where the uh, the vagus nerve is then going to have efferent output that comes down through the the, uh, the branches of the vagus nerve, and it's going to innervate the stomach and just say, "Hey guys, wake up! Something's coming. You don't know it yet, but there there's something happening here." Um, it's going to synapse in the submucosal plexus. Uh, and the submucosal plexus is going to begin to uh, stimulate the, uh, the host of cells that we've talked about there. First of all, the muco mucosal cells, the mucus cells uh, that are on uh, the gastric pits, just at the, at the opening of the gastric pits, they're going to start to produce uh, fluid and mucins to make it all slippery and slimy and wet in the stomach. Uh, the chief cells are going to begin to make pepsinogen. This is a pro-enzyme. Remember I told you any enzyme, any protein that has the ogen ending 
is an inactive enzyme that needs to get activated to do what it does, like angiotensinogen was uh, the protein that was going to get activated by renin to angiotensin, right? Uh, so pepsinogen, you may guess, is not the uh, active form. It's called pepsin. Um, and then these parietal cells are the cells that uh, are doing that whole chloride, alkaline tide, uh, chloride shift business to make the HCL. Uh, and then we have the G cells that are going to get stimulated to make another uh, enzyme called gastrin. And we'll talk about what gastrin does. If you were to guess, if you were to guess, how do you think pepsinogen gets activated? What happens? The answer is on the sheet there. The, char the, the, the character that is responsible uh, for activating pepsinogen is on, is on the sheet. Which, which do you guess it is? The, chi the chief cells make the pepsinogen. They make the pepsinogen. The mucus cells make the mucus. The chief cells make the pepsinogen. The parietal cells make the HCL. Uh, who, what do you think is going to activate that pepsinogen? Take a guess. Guess it's it, pick any of the words up there. One of them will be right. It's probably not food or sight or smell. Plexus. Plexus. Uh, good, but that's not the right answer. The right answer is HCL. Uh, the acid is going to uh, cleave the pepsinogen into pepsin, and we'll see what that does in a moment. All right. <clears throat> so the second phase is the gastric phase. At this point, food has begun to arrive in the stomach, and we're setting off the stretch receptors and the chemoreceptors. The pH is beginning to go up because we're putting uh, HCL into, there, into the stomach. We are adding mucus and fluid to it down there. So uh, those two different afferent inputs are going to continue to reinforce this uh, same uh, business that got started by the brain uh, in the submucosal and myenteric plexuses. Mucus cells going to continue to make mucus. Chief cells continue to make pepsinogen. Parietal cells continue to make HCL. <coughs> uh, we're also going to begin to have these mixing waves. Does anybody need some of this orange? I tor tortured you guys with that. If you need some, just raise your hand. I'll give you some. All right. So the mixing waves are mixing all this mush up in our, in our stomach along with some enzymes that were secreted by the salivary glands. These are salivary amylase and lingual lipase. So salivary amylase um, in animals, the carbohydrate storage molecule is called what, again? What do we call it? How do we store glucose? Glycogen. Glycogen. What do we call it in plants? Cellulose. What's up? Cellulose. Cellulose is a, is a very, very good guess. Um, cellulose is not an energy storage molecule. Cellulose is a structural molecule made of glucose, beta-1 linked. Beta-1 linked glucose is extremely uh, stable, structurally stable, and hydrogen bonds to itself really well, which is why wood is so strong. It's not a good energy storage molecule because it's really hard to get the glucose out of uh, cellulose. It's a really good guess, though. There's, there's a ton of glucose, a ton of energy stored in cellulose, but that's not the right answer. Was that? That is exactly right in terms of layman terms. That's what layman would call it. Uh, a scientist, a carbohydrate chemist, would call it uh, amylose. So amylose is uh, vegetable starch. And it looks very, very similar to, to glycogen. It's, it's almost indistinguishable from, from glycogen. Glycogen and amylose are very, very similar. Well, amylase is an enzyme, an enzyme that ends with ASE 
is some kind of enzyme often uh, uh, if it's LASE that means it's it's often a cutting a clipping enzyme so uh, amylase is an amylose cutting or amylose digesting uh, enzyme it breaks the sugars down that you're eating the starch down uh, from your mouth and then uh, lingual lipase. Does anyone venture a guess as to what a lipase is? Lipids. Yeah, breaks lipids down. Okay, so these are these are enzymes that come in from the mouth um, that are in this fluid. Um, okay, I think that's all I want to say here. Oh, uh, and then the proteins. We have, we're having some peptidases uh, that are getting uh, breaking down. Uh, peptides and proteins. So we have these small bits of proteins and the G cells are saying, Woo, all right, uh, and they're getting activated. Mm, to produce more gastrin, gastrin is reinforcing, is reinforcing all of these, uh, these, it's a hormone. And this is some of the endocrine uh, function here. So gastrin is getting released into the circulation and uh, coming back through uh, the enteroendocrine system to, uh, to further uh, stimulate the chief cells, the parietal cells, and uh, the contractions. Step three, the intestinal phase. Well, stomach has done a pretty good job of acidifying all the stuff. Your, your mouth broke it down, like in a, in a chewing it, broke it down uh, to a certain rough approximation. The stomach puts acid in there that's cleaving all kinds of bonds. Uh, we've got amylase, lipase, proteases, peptidases, breaking stuff down. It's been like churned by the stomach. It's starting to get into a good mush. Um, Anybody who's ever vomited has a pretty good sense of what that looks like. Uh, so at that point, uh, the pyloric sphincter, I should get my pointer, uh, <coughs> the pyloric sphincter right here begins to release and uh, passes the, this chyme passes from the stomach through the pylorus into the duodenum. And as soon as this happens, we've got stretch receptors here that <clears throat> are going to uh, activate a whole, the production of a whole series of uh, hormones. We've got uh, cholecystokinin, we've got gastric inhibitory peptide, uh, secretin, uh, and the job of these things... Uh, so this gets stimulated by lipids and proteins. This is sti stimulated by the presence of lipids and carbohydrates. Uh, a lower pH here uh, from the acid coming from the stomach is going to stimulate secretin. All of this is via, these hormones via circulation are going to come back and begin to turn off uh, the upstream um, mechanisms that... Uh, we're in the stomach. So it's going to turn off the chief cells, the parietal cells. It's going to slow down the peristalsis from the myenteric, uh, uh, fr from the, the, uh, the muscle layers of the stomach. So this happens within an hour or two after uh, ingestion of food. All right. These st uh, stretch receptors are also uh, hardwired via uh, the myenteric plexus uh, to turn off the myenteric plexus upstream, all right? <clears throat> so um, here is what, this is, here's how we make pepsin. <clears throat> uh, pepsin gets produced by pepsinogen. Uh, the word that describes uh, this proenzyme 
is zymogen. Zymogen. Zymogen and proenzyme. The proenzyme is a kind of a more generalized term, but they basically mean the same thing here. A zymogen is a word for this inactive protein, uh, and you can tell it's a zymogen because it has the ogen on the end. So here is pepsinogen. Uh, HCl comes in and it, it recognizes this bond here between these two amino acids, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't actually know uh, what that particular linkage is uh, for pepsinogen, but whatever it is, it's, it in particular is uh, susceptible to uh, cleavage by HCl, relieves uh, the protein of this regulatory peptide that's keeping this thing inactive, and as soon as that is released, we have pepsin, which is the active peptide here. Uh, this is a peptidase, which is going to uh, take all these dietary proteins. So here is your, uh, your beans, and here is your, uh, your buffalo, and it's going to break all this stuff down into smaller peptides and amino acids. All right, so that's peptin. It's a protease that gets turned on. Uh, here's some pathology. So this is another pretty interesting story. I feel like the, the history of all of medicine, but uh, today I'm feeling like the history of uh, gastroenterology is really uh, littered with these pretty colorful stories. Um, has anybody heard of this guy before, Barry Marshall? He was a physician uh, who back in the 70s, no, pardon me, 80, 1981, he was studying gastric ulcers and was taking uh, tissue cultures from these peptic ulcers. And uh, <coughs> he was finding that they had one thing in common. This little bug, this little bad guy right here, look at that thing. That's, that's pretty evil looking. Uh, this H. pylori, Helobacter pylori bacteria, was uh, found at the site of all of these peptic uh, ulcers. And he said, hey, the ulcers, uh, peptic ulcers, are an infection. They're an infection. We could treat them with antibiotics. Because up to this point, up to the early 80s, it had been treated with antacids. They thought it was some sort of, you know, is related to the type of food you ate and... Uh, high acid foods made it worse, and so they gave people antacids uh, to deal with this problem. And it, and everybody told him he was crazy. You are insane. You are wrong. This is incorrect. How could? And why did they think that? Why do you think they thought that? Why do, did the medical community have no belief in the fact? that uh, there could be a bacterial infection in your stomach, bacteria down in the lumen of your stomach uh, in this environment with all these proteases, uh, amylases, lipases, in the, in the presence of HCL at, point, at a pH of, yeah. Totally, totally. What, what, organic thing is going to be able to survive passage through uh, the stomach, because it's a very harsh environment. Profoundly misunderstanding the way the body works, of course, because uh, your whole GI tract is full of bacteria. It's full of bacteria. How do they get there? How do they get there? How do they pass through the stomach? Well, <clears throat> not one to be daunted by naysayers, uh, Dr. Barry Marshall mixed up a big, big uh, flask of Helobacter pylori and swigged it. He just drank it, not telling you to do this yourself, but he swigged it and gave himself a wicked case of ulcers. Um, <clears throat> and then said, no problem, took a course of antibiotics, cleared it right up. And everybody said, oh my God. Uh, and at that point, overnight, after this guy's uh, rather daring uh, demonstration, um, the treatment of peptic ulcers radically changed. So it's now known to be uh, a problem with infection from 
uh, that little green bad guy right there. So he got the Nobel Prize uh, 25 years uh, later. So here, there he was. Discovered that in graduate school. He must have been, uh, that was the, the fire of youth driving him uh, to make this, this bold experiment. All right, on to the small intestine. <clears throat> so the duodenum, the mixing bowl, it's small. It's small. It's only 10 inches long. It receives the chyme, uh, which is what we now call it. We don't, it's not poop. It is not food, really, any longer. Uh, <clears throat> the food that we have masticated or chewed up and uh, partially digested in the stomach and passed through the pylorus is now called chyme. Um, and besides um, adding all kinds of different additional peptidases and amylases and et cetera uh, to the chyme, it's going to neutralize it. It's going to uh, bring the pH way back up uh, outside of the acidic uh, area. So the acidic portion of uh, digestion happens in the stomach, and it's the job of the duodenum to adjust the pH uh, to a more normal range for passage to the rest of the GI tract. Um, the jejunum <clears throat> is much longer. It's about uh, eight feet long. And this is where uh, all of those other digestive enzymes that are added to uh, the chyme by the duodenum uh, begin to do their job. And this is where the bulk of chemical digestion happens. Uh, we also have uh, some nutrient absorption that happens there. Uh, this is where the plica circularis that I talked about in, in lab are found. Uh, following the, the jejunum is the ileum. It's about uh, 12 feet long and uh, ends at the ileocecal valve um, at the cecum. So there are these different uh, reflexes, muscular reflexes, uh, that are mediated by the myenteric plexus uh, throughout the GI tract. In the stomach, we call them gastric reflexes. Um, and... Uh, throughout the small intestine, we call them gastroenteric reflexes. These are reflexes that are controlling uh, contraction, which is giving rise to motility of uh, the chyme through the bolus of, of chyme through the intestines, and then uh, the, the different secretions uh, that, that are necessary. And then finally, there's the gastroileal reflex. Uh, this is the reflex that opens up uh, the ileocecal valve uh, to allow the food to pass from the uh, intestines into the into the uh, into the cecum of the large intestine. So uh, the the ileum is uh, the site of uh, most of the bulk nutrient absorption. So ninety percent of nutrient absorption is going to happen in either the jejunum or the ileum. So let's get a little bit more technical here. Uh, we, we went through the anatomy in lab today, and you see the mucus cells uh, with their brush border enzymes. So uh, I talked about there being um, the, the high level of surface area on the surface of uh, the intestinal villi. Uh, and how there were these arborized glycoproteins uh, that stick out on the surface of uh, these cells. This is what's called the quote-unquote brush border. Uh, these glycoproteins are enzymes that are going to help, uh, that are going to aid in, in digestion. So here we see a depiction of uh, one of these uh, mucin monomers of the, of the brush border protein core with these uh, mucilaginous uh, appendages decorating the length of that protein. All right. Um, 
I don't know what my point was here besides nice picture. Uh, but that's, that is a depiction of uh, the VLI uh, with uh, these, these crypts of Lieberkuhn um, in between each of them. And little food particles. This is your lunch, my orange, whatever, passing through the intestines. All right, so you can't talk about the duodenum without talking about the pancreas. The pancreas um, has two different uh, types of cells. I'm sorry, I shouldn't, two, two categories of cells. There are endocrine cells and en exocrine cells. The endocrine cells are the ones we've talked about so far when we talked about the endocrine system. Uh, there were alpha and beta cells, right? Beta cells make insulin. About 80% of, of the endocrine cells in these pancreatic islets are beta, and then alpha makes glucagon. Um, so insulin is made when you have high blood sugar. It helps the cells take up the sugar, and glucagon is made when you have low blood sugar, and it helps mobilize glycogen. All right, so that's these pancreatic islets, the alpha and beta cells, <clears throat> right here, endocrine tissue. All the rest of this business here is these pancreatic acini, the uh, acinar cells. So here's one, two, three, all, each of these are pancreatic uh, acini. They are exocrine, exocrine cells. So they don't go into the circulatory system. Instead, they are a secretory epithelium that are going to uh, secrete their uh, pancreatic fluids onto the surface of that epithelium, which will go into, this, uh, into these ducts uh, in, in this glandular tissue here, which are going to eventually all converge on a larger pancreatic duct uh, that's going to head towards the duodenum. All right. And what are these uh, exocrine cells making? Well, they're making pancreatic juice. A lot of it, actually, about as much uh, as would fit uh, into Jack's blue uh, water bottle there. A day. Um, those are pancreatic alpha amylase. Uh, so what did I say amylase was? ACE means it does what? It's an enzyme, right? And what do the amyl refer to? It breaks up amylose. Breaks up Thank you, Liz. Uh, there's a, a lot of different amylase genes out there, uh, and this one is the pancreatic alpha amylase. Um, it also makes its own lipase. Uh, so up until this point, most of the amylase and lipase that's been in the chyme has been from the mouth. Um, and uh, it also is producing a ribonuclease and a deoxyribonuclease. What would you guess those do? What do you think a ribonuclease does, Jack, if you had to guess? Ribonuclease. What's that? Ribonuclease. A ribonuclease or a deoxyribonuclease? Uh, it cleaves the RNA, the ribonucleic acid, and the deoxyribonucleic acid, so the DNA and the RNA, yeah. Um, don't get that confused with ribosomes. Um, and then it makes various proteases and peptidase zymogens that are going to get turned on. <coughs> so it's breaking down basically the four categories. It's making, uh, it's making chemicals, enzymes, that are going to break down the four types of nutrients. Amylase uh, is going to be carbohydrates, lipase is lipids, ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease are nucleic acids, and then protease are pept peptides. We've got carbohydrate, lipid, DNA, RNA, and protein. So those are the four categories of nucleic acid. All right. So here comes the pancreatic juice. Squirts out here with a little bit of bile uh, through the, the duodenal papilla. And it's got the amylase. We're just going to look at the amylase for now. Uh, we have starch, the amylose, coming in. This amylase breaks it down into maltose, uh, which is a, is a uh, anyone had a, a malted 
before a malted milkshake. Malt, the maltose is a disaccharide uh, that is a subunit of larger, uh, larger uh, complex carbohydrates or other polysaccharides, uh, and then other oligosaccharides. So it breaks the sugar into smaller bits. Uh, and then we have contact digestion with this brush border. Uh, there's maltases that are going to break the maltose up into glucose and galactose. Uh, dextrinases that are going to break up the dextrin, which is another type of carbohydrate. Uh, and the glucoamylase, uh, which is going to cleave off the glucose from the end of uh, the amylose. Anyways, these are all carbohydrate uh, digesting uh, enzymes that are on this brush border. Eventually, uh, in the end, it's going to leave us with a bunch of glucose. There are other carbohydrates, though, because uh, maltose definitely has uh, something besides glucose in it, uh, but most of it's going to be glucose. Um, the salivary amylase that, that's in the food when we, that when we chew it doesn't work at this pH. So it basically gets, the, the carbohydrates don't really get broken down especially well in the stomach after uh, we swallow the food. Uh, and a lot of that starch makes it into the gut here for, for breakdown here. 50% of the dietary starch <coughs> is digested by the salivary amylase, but uh, we have a lot to do after the stomach. Uh, and then here is uh, the zymogens, the, the proteases and peptidases. Uh, <clears throat> so we've got the names are trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase. So uh, these are not unactive uh, enzymes or zymogens that are going to get activated. Uh, so trypsinogen uh, gets activated by enterokinase, uh, which has its feedback mechanism of turning all the trypsinogen on. And then the same thing here, the chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase gets activated by the brush border to chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase. And trypsin uh, helps facilitate all of that. All right, so that is, we did sugars, proteins, let's do fats. Um, <clears throat> So the steps of fat digestion go from uh, emulsification uh, to then fat hydrolysis, then to lipid uptake. So we're, we're kind of breaking it down uh, from large to small as we go down this way. First, we start with a big, greasy fat globule. It tastes so good. Mm. Uh, this fat globule is not readily absorbable, however. So our body uh, makes this lecithin here, which is a, uh, is a type of lipid, uh, and these bile acids. So this can, these are uh, the derivatives of bilirubin and biliverdin uh, in your bile. Uh, there's a hydrophilic region and a hydrophobic region that they uh, depicted in this cartoon. Basically, this fat globule is broken up into tiny little droplets uh, through the action of lecithin uh, coordinating these bile salts, basically surrounding it into little uh, bits that are easier to, to suspend uh, in solution. Uh, these fat dro uh, droplets then go through hydrolysis. So here's a triglyceride uh, of some sort that is one of the fats in this big uh, fat droplet. And uh, our lipase, our pancreatic lipase, is going to cleave this apart. So that's a, that's a kind of a silly cartoon uh, of a triglyceride. A glyceride, glycerol is a three-carbon fragment right here. It's a three-carbon fragment. Uh, each of the carbons has a hydroxyl group or an alcohol group on it uh, that... Uh, um, Alcohol participates in an ester formation, uh, so an alcohol plus a carboxylic acid can form an ester. For those of you who've taken uh, organic chemistry, so these are ester bonds. The lipase cleaves the ester bond, uh, relieving the carboxylic acids of two of those fatty acids, 
and leaving one of the ester bonds here. So now we get a monoglyceride. So here's glycerol. This has an got an OH group. This has got an OH group, two alcohols, and then one ester bond is still living here, uh, is still extant here in the, in the middle attached to uh, that fatty acid. So this is a monoglyceride. Uh, and when you get your blood tests, uh, you're looking at triglycerides and monoglycerides. This is, this is what they're looking at, like how much of this stuff is floating around in your blood. All right. These free fatty acids and uh, the monoglycerides are then taken up uh, into these micelles. So cholesterol and various uh, fat-soluble uh, vitamins uh, pack in with these monoglycerides and fatty acids uh, into these uh, different uh, lipid drops, these micelles. These are significantly smaller uh, than these emulsification droplets, uh, much smaller. Uh, and then these micelles... Um, uh, are, are much more readily handled by the absorbed and, and handled by the uh, digestive system. All right, on to the liver. So we've talked about uh, we've talked about how the liver uh, receives 20 percent of the cardiac output, right? A lot of blood passes through the liver. And uh, about a third of that uh, is via the hepatic artery. And you, you may be thinking to yourself, how is that possible through, you know, how is that 20% of cardiac output possible through that little uh, hepatic artery? It's actually not that large an artery. Well, it's because only a third of that is coming uh, through that. Two-thirds of it is coming through the large uh, hepatic portal vein, which is returning blood to the liver from where? Come on, guys. I asked you this question in the lab. What's that? Not the kidneys. The kidneys are getting their own rich blood supply, 20 to 25%. What do you think, Rob? The colon. That's it. That's right. The mesenteric arteries. The mesenteric arteries. So all of the intestines are sending uh, their blood back to the heart via the liver. The hepatic portal system. Uh, <sighs> That's the blood supply uh, and the way that the hepatocytes uh, are able to adjust the levels of circulating nutrients by handling all those nutrients that are coming out of the, the gut before they reach general circulation. <clears throat> it's also responsible for making the bile salts, right? Uh, those bile <coughs> salts uh, are stored here in the, in the gallbladder. The gallbladder... Um, contracts and ejects its uh, bile salts uh, under the influence of cholecystokinin, uh, which is that enzyme produced in the duodenum uh, by the presence of lipids and um, presence of lipids and was it proteins? No, carbohydrates. CCK. Carbohydrates. Um, and it also contro uh, controls uh, the hepatopancreatic sphincter on uh, the end of that uh, duodenal papilla uh, that, that's choking off the neck here and controlling the pancreas and the, and the uh, common bile duct. So the CCK produced in the duodenum is uh, causing the ejection of bile salts and opening up the door for uh, that right there. All right. So... Uh, the liver itself is the, the, all of the functionality of the liver <coughs> comes from these, <coughs> pardon me, hepatocytes. And um, it's taken care of. The liver is monitored, maintained uh, by these special cells called Kupfer cells. Uh, here's a really beautiful picture of them. Uh, they're basically macrophages that are going around in the liver looking for red blood cells that, that are not looking, that look like they're past their shelf life, uh, need to be broken down. That um, the, why, why is that important in the liver? Why is the liver doing that? Given what I just told you uh, about uh, what bile is and what bile is doing and how bile is helping us get fat into the body. What did I say bile was made up of? 
and why uh, is it important that the liver is a, a these Kupfer cells? Uh, why is it important that uh, they are recycling the red blood cells? I'm leaving a couple steps in the chain out here. I'm trying to get you to connect the dots. It's it's a little bit it's a little bit sophisticated, not too sophisticated. What um, <clears throat> okay, he here's a big clue. The answer is on the bottom of the slide. <laughs> Red blood cells are the source of hemoglobin, right? And the heme molecule is in hemoglobin. Uh, and I told you that hemo the breakdown of hemoglobin, basically the removal of the iron, is where we get Billy Rubin and Billy Verdon. Billy Rubin and Billy Verdon are what we're using to make uh, the bile salts. All right, that's that's the source of the bile salts. Uh, so it makes sense that the liver has a prime role in turning over red blood cells because it needs that hemoglobin to make the bile salts to dissolve the fat to get it into your body. Does that make sense? Okay, and it's the job of these Kupfer cells to do that turnover, uh, to provide the bile salts that the, uh, that the hepatocytes need, uh, to, to provide the, the bilirubin and biliverdin that the, the uh, hepatocytes need. All right. Um, so, uh, and then this bilirubin uh, is, uh, goes through these metabolic pathways here, and can either uh, some of the downstream byproducts of them either end up in the feces uh, from these stercobilins or urobilin. There's a lot of steps in here. And uh, the urobilinogen can also uh, end up, it's, it's one of the sources of, of uh, urine, uh, urea that ends up in the urine, these nitrogen containing uh, uh, amide groups there. All right, we won't go into the chemistry of that too, too deeply, but. Um, all right, so this is an overview of uh, the hormones in the digestive tract. Uh, we have gastrin. Uh, what was gastrin produced by? What, what kind of cell made gastrin? What did I say? It's pretty easy. G cells, yeah, G cells make gastrin. Uh, so, <clears throat> Gastrin stimulates acid production uh, and stimulates, uh, it's, a, it's an endocrine hormone that goes into the secretion, is secreted into the, uh, into the bloodstream and um, turns on the, the parietal cells who are doing, what are the parietal cells doing again? I'm doing this motion here. What was that indicating? The HCL, yeah, the chloride shift and the alkaline tide. Right, in the parietal cells. Um, and it's also feeding into the myenteric plexus uh, that's increasing uh, the motility in the wall of the stomach. Um, then down in the uh, duodenum, we have the production. So these chemoreceptors, these uh, stretch receptors, uh, produce uh, this host of... of uh, uh, hormones here. We have gastric inhibitory peptide uh, that is going to turn off gastrin. So it's feeding backwards and turning off uh, the stomach by, uh, so gastrin is a strong endocrine regulator of the stomach. Uh, it's trying to turn off the stomach at the source, at its regulatory source by inhibiting gastrin. Um, and then it's also this gastric inhibitory peptide has the dual purpose of actually stimulating um, the beta cells in the pancreatic islets to release their insulin. All right, and the insulin is going to uh, get into the bloodstream. It's going to facilitate the pickup of uh, glucose into the cells. Um, uh, we also have secretin, cholecystokinin, uh, VIP, all of these uh, enzymes are going to, uh, uh, are going to uh, basically 
facilitate the digestive processes uh, in the duodenum. Uh, we talked about CCK and secretin a couple uh, slides ago, uh, where it's going to activate some of these uh, pancreatic enzymes, and the bile secretion cholecystokinin uh, is, is helping that gallbladder to contract and eject all the bile salts. Um, yeah, and then we're dilating, the VIP uh, is dilating the intestinal capillaries, perfusing the gut with blood, allowing that engorged gut to uh, absorb as much nutrients as it possibly can. All right. So, and this is all in preparation for when this food arrives in the jejunum. So we have uh, intestinal capillaries open, we have food that's been digested properly, and we have insulin in the bloodstream. Everything is set for the jejunum to pick up as much nutrients as it can and chuck it into the bloodstream. All right. That's the uh, small intestine. On to the large intestine. What does it do? It compacts uh, your feces, it absorbs water, and picks up uh, as many bile salts as it possibly can. Um, a very little amount of nutrient uh, absorption happens here. Uh, this is also where we pick up a lot of vitamins that are produced by bacteria. Um, so, and this is kind of an interesting uh, thing. I'm going to diverge for a moment because I, I can and I want to. Uh, has anybody ever had to deal with a newborn baby at all? Change a newborn baby's diaper. What does that look like? Not a, not a new, 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 newborn baby, but a, like not their first poopy diaper ever, uh, which is black and myconium and it was a little weird. But the baby's been uh, sucking on some good milk for a couple weeks now, and what do their diapers look like? Mush. What's that? Mush. mush. What color is the mush? It's pretty light colored. Uh, in fact, uh, it's sort of, uh, I love Indian food, but it's kind of, it looks like, <laughs> you know, it's like a, an orangey yellow curry looking stuff, right? I mean, that, and what does it smell like? Not as bad as you might think it would smell like. It doesn't really smell that bad, right? Uh, has anyone ever had total uh, cereal for breakfast? Anything like that? Any of those? And what I'm going to, uh, or how about this? You don't have to tell me about the color of your urine, but what does some else's person, some other person's urine look like after having had uh, a blast of, of like a multivitamin or total or something like that? This is bright yellow color, right? Well, the color is for the same reason. Um, babies get uh, a bulk of their B-complex vitamins that you would find in your total or your multivitamins or coloring your urine. They get the bulk of those vitamins not from the mother's milk, but from the bacteria in their gut, uh, from the E. coli in their gut <clears throat> that are producing this host of uh, vitamins here, all right? Um, there's vitamin K. It's a clotting factor synthesis. Some babies who uh, do not have, that do not get inoculated. So let me, let me, I, I love talking about babies. Um, when babies are born, a, a natural childbirth, not a C-section, a, a baby is born ideally a head first presenting, it's called ROP, uh, and it means their head is pointing posteriorly, that's what P stands for. When they come out, um, the baby's head is pointing backwards uh, with the nose and face right in the perineum. That's not a mistake. That's not actually a mistake. Um, the baby's initial inoculation with intestinal flora comes through the contact uh, of the baby's face and mouth with the perineal region of the mother, which is totally fluid with her own uh, intestinal bacteria. 
that's where the baby gets its initial bacteria that it needs because the baby is sterile in the in the womb, right? So, um, <clears throat> some babies uh, that inoculation doesn't go well. Uh, it can be um, so. There is and. Some babies do not get enough vitamin K in, uh, from the intestinal flora. And so one of the things you can do is uh, give babies a little shot of uh, vitamin K uh, postpartum. That, that's one of the things that happens. Uh, there's a, a movement now uh, amongst uh, physicians because America, and I'm just going to say it because it's a bit of a political statement, and I try to avoid that as much as I can, at least during class, uh, America has a, a, a real, I don't know if pandemic is the right word, but uh, it is, is a, a really widespread um, incidence of C-section. There's a lot of C-sections in America. A lot of it um, is, a lot of it is not necessary. It's, it's done much more uh, than it needs to be done. Uh, part, some of it is for convenience. Women just want to pencil in their uh, birth date, and it happens. Another is because uh, childbirth has been really medicalized in our country, and so you, the woman goes into the hospital, and, uh, and she stalls because hospitals are a little bit intense and intimidating for a lot of women. It's not the most natural environment to be in where the woman feels relaxed and, is enab and enables that baby to just come out. Uh, and so they stall and uh, put stress on the baby. Doctors want to intervene and they throw them into the C-section route where uh, once you start a C-section, the doctor has total control, right? They know exactly how it's going to come out. There's no mystery. No, there's no, like, they, they know the outcome. They have total control. So that's why they like that. And that has, the incidence of that has gone up significantly. There are doctors now, though, who are recognizing the importance of that initial inoculation. And I'm going to talk about the bacteria and vitamins in a, in a moment here. Uh, and so what they're doing in C-sections are taking uh, swabs uh, of, the, of the mother's perineum for C-section delivered babies and then and trying to inoculate them uh, postpartum to try to, to reproduce a little bit of, of, of that. And I think that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm a carbohydrate chemist, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about this because I think it's interesting. Uh, when I was in graduate school, there is, uh, so E. coli are the bacteria that are predominantly present in the, in the gut of a baby. And uh, although it's a very small component of your own intestinal flora now, uh, E. coli are, are present in babies because they have a different diet than you do. They have a diet solely of milk, mother's milk, right? And E. coli like mother's milk. Uh, which is why there's so many of them in the baby's gut. In 1954, uh, there was uh, a pair of Frenchmen named Jacob and Minot who got uh, the Nobel Prize for identifying the first example of gene regulation. Uh, and this was the LAC operon. Has ever, anybody heard of the LAC operon before? Maybe a few of you guys. Uh, <clears throat> the LAC operon is a gene in E. coli that controls uh, the ability of the bacteria to um, absorb lactose and metabolize the lactose that's in the mother's milk. <clears throat> and what does the baby get for these bacteria stealing all of this uh, lactose? The bacteria make these B-complex vitamins, all these different vitamins, vitamin K, uh, biotin, that is what is giving the baby's uh, feces its yellow color. It's the vitamins that are being produced, the by cellular byproducts of the metabolism of the E. coli. Um, just to toot my own horn a little bit, the, uh, the effector of the LAC operon um, is, is the molecular key, and there is a point to this, not just me patting myself on the back, but uh, it, there's a molecular key that turns the lac operon on. 
Okay, so lactose is a, I won't draw it on the board for you, but it's um, a disaccharide of galactose beta 1, 4 linked to glucose. All right, so it's a glucose ring and a galactose ring, two sugars and a disaccharide. Uh, that beta 1, 4 linkage in galactose to glucose is pretty easy to break down. Uh, but for the E. coli to turn that gene on, what turns that gene on? Uh, it's turned on by a different sugar. It's the effector of the lac operon. It's the key. It's called allolactose. Allolactose. And they figured that out. Minot and Jacob received the Nobel Prize uh, for that. Uh, that allolactose uh, is the effector. And it is a disaccharide that is beta 1, 6 linked. Uh, and that may mean nothing to any of you, probably. Uh, but 1, 6 linked disaccharides. Uh, they had never known the crystal structure of that uh, compound, but in graduate school, I spent three years uh, trying to do it, and I solved the crystal structure. I got a little crystal, and I, uh, super tiny little crystal of it, and I had to build some glassware, and I sent it off to the beam line in Berkeley, and, and it received only the second... Uh, one six link disaccharide crystal structure ever solved. Anyways, the, the real point of this is not to brag about that, but um, to make the point that uh, mother's milk had, so this is me contrasting mother's milk and formula, because there's a lot of debate about this that is uninformed, and I'm going to tell you exactly what's happening. Uh, mother's milk, yes, formula does have the macronutrients. It's got all the lactose, of course. They try to make it look like mother's milk, but they don't have the resources to put allolactose into mother's milk, which is the, is the uh, uh, effector of the lac operon that the bacteria need to use the, uh, the milk appropriately. So what's important about mother's milk are the micronutrients that are in it that enable the mother's milk to be uh, used properly by the intestinal flora in a baby. Uh, okay. I like talking about that stuff. We'll, we'll move on. Uh, were there any questions? That was a major tangent. I just went out there. Uh, okay. So instead of, since I went on that big tangent, this is, this is all review. This is all review, uh, except a little bit about chylomicrons. Uh, but pretty much this is all review here. The only point I'm going to make is that um, you consume about 200, um, 2,000 milliliters, two liters, two of these uh, blue things, jacks, a day, and you lose about 150 mils in your feces uh, a day. Um, and so you, there's a lot of fluid that goes in. You put about a liter and a half in your saliva, a liter and a half uh, in your gastric secretions, a liter goes in from your liver, a liter comes in from your pancreas. Uh, two liters from your uh, intestinal secretions and another 200 from the colonic secretions. That's a lot, uh, right? So there's, um, there's uh, a liter and a half, three liters, four liters, five liters, six, seven liters. Seven liters of fluid that your body's dumping into this and you're only putting in two liters uh, you got to suck all that water back out or you're going to be massively dehydrated. So resorption of water is a huge uh, part of uh, the digestive system. The, importance, uh, the important point I'm making here is that people with dysentery type diseases uh, or, or um, hemorrhagic type diseases uh, <clears throat> like um, so dysentery would be like giardia or uh, cholera or something, or and um, or Ebola is is a hemorrhagic type where these people just have massive diarrhea. Uh, this flu. What the problem is here is not that uh, they're they're putting more fluid into their intestine than they normally would. They're just not sucking it back out. They're not pulling it out, and so uh, they're just losing mass amounts of fluid. And, and that's really one of the biggest problems in dealing with these uh, type patients is, is fluid maintenance in them. And you have to stick them on an IV and basically just running huge amounts of fluid through their body. 
Um, okay. So I've been a little long in the tooth today, uh, but I'm going to try to talk about some uh, cellular respiration and metabolism. Uh, and I, I know, please don't jump for joy, <laughs> but um, I, I find it interesting, and we're, we're going to talk about it a bit. So here's all the nutrients that have been absorbed by the GI tract. And now, the, the rest of this lecture here, I've got about 20 minutes to bring everything together, everything that we've been talking about all semester together. We've talked about respiration, external respiration. We've talked about uh, the kidneys. We've talked about bone and, and metabolic uh, need. I'm going to talk about what we do with all of this stuff and what internal or cellular respiration is or means. Because that's, it, it, it requires us to put all these pieces in place so that you can then begin to understand really what's going on. Uh, we're going to lift the hood and just take a tiny peek at a giant world, at a giant world, uh, the biochemistry of a cell. All right. So these organic molecules come in and uh, become part of a nu the nutrient pool. And what happens here to these nutrients? Well, these are, this is the super generalized uh, depiction of the outcomes. You can either have anabolism. Uh, anabolism is the process of building bigger things out of smaller parts. So you can take the little nutrients. These are amino acids. These are sugars. These are lipids, simple sugars. Uh, and you can take them and build something bigger. All right, and why do we do this? This can be for storage, uh, growth, repair, maintenance, secretion, whatever. You, you can make all kinds of things uh, out of these little parts. The process of catabolism is just breaking big things down, uh, uh, catabolizing it, and those little parts join this nutrient pool. The other thing that can happen to these nutrients in the nutrient pool they can go into uh, cent central respiration or uh, catabolism via the mitochondria. The mitochondria are little energy factories. They're like, they're like coal-burning power plants uh, in your body that, that, have, uh, that have their carbon emission. So how does this work? We're going to talk about that. Uh, the, the purpose of this is storing this energy that's in the nutrient pool as ATP, which can either drive an anabolic processes or it can do other things that ATP does. And we've hardly had a lecture where I haven't talked about the need for ATP in driving something, right? It can drive the contraction of muscles and transport across the membrane. It can turn all kinds of enzymes off and on, make things endocytosis, exocytosis, etc. Um, about 40% of the energy released by breaking these chemical bonds is used to drive ATP, and 60% of it is lost as heat. So you may think, damn, that is not very efficient. Uh, but actually, it, the, the mitochondria is profoundly efficient, profoundly efficient. For uh, humans to build a machine, an electrical machine, that uses, uh, productively uses 40% of the energy uh, potential in, in the electricity that's being provided to that machine is, is just a dream. All right. Um, so this is, uh, I, what I'm doing here is I'm taking this little bit right here, and I'm going to expand it. I'm going to add a little more detail. All right, so what are these nutrient pools? We have fatty acids, glucose, and amino acids. Uh, they, they can go up anabolically. Fatty acids make triglycerides, glucose makes glycogen, and amino acids makes proteins. Or they can all funnel down, feed down, into these small carbon chains like acetyl-CoA, pyruvate. Uh, we'll look at them in a moment. And it's these small carbon chains that get sucked up by the mitochondria and enter these two cycles, all right? So first of all, this arrow is called glycolysis. This arrow is called beta oxidation. And then to get down to the small carbon chains, they go into the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, uh, which then produces coenzymes that feed into this electron transport chain. 
which is how uh, we produce ATP by taking carbon and uh, and uh, oxidizing uh, oxygen. I'm sorry, and oxidizing the carbon from these small carbon chains and kicking out water. All right, so we're taking carbon hydrogen bonds. We're taking carbon hydrogen bonds. We're cleaving carbon carbon hydrogen bonds. Uh, and by replacing them with bonds to oxygen by giving us carbon dioxide and, and uh, water. All right, see that? So these small carbon chains have lots of CH bonds. We're going to break those CH bonds, releasing the energy in those CH bonds and giving us the CO2 we exhale and just water that en enters the ambient uh, pool. All right, so uh, let me... We're going to look first at this arrow right here. Glycolysis. And I have a note to myself to curb my enthusiasm uh, about this. Uh, I certainly uh, get excited about this kind of thing. But um, so I'll try to point out the important parts. Here's glucose. Uh, this is not, it's, this isn't a Fisher projection. It's not as a ring. It's just a, it's a long chain, stretched out as a chain. Uh, and uh, glucose is right here. Uh, it gets cleaved into two parts, this part and this part, uh, which both become, at the end of the day, pyruvic acid. So I'm pointing out the important parts here, okay? I don't need you to know all these names. Um, uh, so glucose gets broken down into two things that end up as pyruvic acid. This is going to be what goes into the mitochondria, all right? Um, and here are some terms, these four words, I want you to be familiar with. Um, going from glucose down to, pyr to pyruvate or pyruvic acid, going down, we call glycolysis. Glycolysis, taking glucose and lysing it or cutting it, glycolysis. Going from pyruvate or a small carbon fragment up to glucose is what we call gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. Making genesis new neoglucose. Gluconeogenesis, right? Um, from glucose, we can go uh, upwards to these larger structures anabolically. That's called uh, glycogenesis, glycogenesis, and I'm sorry that glycogenesis seems like it should be what we call glycolysis is opposite, but it's not. Gluconeogenesis is the opposite of glycolysis. Glycogenesis is how we make glycogen. Glycogen is in the word. Glycogen is in the word glycogenesis, all right? Glycogen is not in this gluconeogenesis. Gluco, like glucose, is in gluconeogenesis. Glycogenesis is how we make glycogen, uh, and then glycogenolysis is how we break it down. So glycogen is in this word, breaking it down from glycogen to glucose. Those are four words I need you to know. One other thing I'm going to point out for uh, Monday when we watch uh, that Robert Lustig movie is that fructose 6-phosphate, uh, uh, fructose, is in the middle of this pathway. It's in the middle of this pathway. This is an important, uh, this is an important branching point. There are so this this little arrow here, other carbohydrates. That's pretty enigmatic. That is huge, man. I could I could spend a whole semester talking about that box right there. So, um, but this is this is going to become important on Monday. We'll talk about fructose and, and what happens there. Um, the only other point to make here is that this whole process of breaking. Uh, glucose down into pyruvate only gets us two ATP. We only get two ATP out of that. Not that big a deal, right? Well, we're going to see where the, where the money's at. This is anaerobic metabolism. You'll notice, looking at it, there's no oxygen anywhere there. That happens whether you have oxygen or not in the cells. Anaerobic metabolism only gives you two ATP. All right, so that small carbon fragment then gets into the mitochondria um, and enters this tricarboxylic acid cycle, uh, the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. 
used to be called the Zent Georgi Krebs cycle, but this poor guy, Zent Georgi, uh, was not, his name was not as easy to pronounce as uh, this German dude here, uh, Craig, uh, Krebs, this guy was Hungarian. Uh, they both got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, they, they did the same work, but uh, this dude fell off the tree, and his name is the one that persisted for a long time. Uh, TCA cycle is what we call it nowadays. Uh, so pyruvic acid uh, gets a carbon dioxide clipped off, and by so doing, we make NADH. This is a coenzyme. Basically, the whole point of the, TH, uh, of the TCA cycle is to make these, uh, these reducible, or I'm sorry, these highly reduced oxidizable uh, coenzymes. There's a bunch of uh, CH bonds here. FADH2, NADH, 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 NADH. These are reduced coenzymes that we're going <coughs> to oxidize, all right? And in so doing, uh, we're going to... Um, we're going to get energy out. So uh, we're going to cut another carbon dioxide off. In fact, we're going to cleave two carbon dioxides off. This, ac this acetyl-CoA uh, comes in, binds to this four-carbon fragment, and goes around in this circle here. So the four-carbon fragment becomes six carbons. That's citric acid. That's vitamin C. Right? That vitamin C gets uh, a carbon dioxide cleaved, and we get... Uh, a reductive, uh, two reductive units, and then uh, we get another five carbon fragment uh, that gets a CO2 cleaved off, and we get two more reductive uh, equivalents. Uh, some ATP comes off. We continue to go around this. We're not going to go into the details of that. The point is it's just going around this circle where uh, this pyruvic acid gets broken down into three molecules of carbon dioxide. And we made all of these coenzymes, which are going to go into the second part, the electron transport chain, which, hold your breath, here it is. A uh, lot of details here. Do not need you to uh, know all of these. But I'm going to point out, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, they had just discovered this enzyme here. So all the NADH, uh, FADH, enters into this chain of enzymes that are embedded in the inner leaflet of uh, the mitochondria. And their job is uh, to get, th these get oxidized, and in so doing, uh, they drive uh, H plus ions across this membrane and create a... a uh, an acid, acidic gradient, a hydrogen ion gradient, where there's a lot of H plus out here and not much in here. Uh, this gradient drives this, this enzyme right here, the FOF1 ATP synthase. I remember being in graduate school when that was um, visualized for the first time. At, at, I was at UVA uh, in Virginia, and uh, this guy came into class, I forget his name now, uh, he had the first ever, um, so the way is, the way the classes were taught that, um, that experts on a topic came in and gave just a couple lectures in the cell uh, biology class. So this guy uh, who was working on the FOF1 ATP synthase uh, got the first picture of it, and what he had done is conjugated a, a green GFP, a green fluorescent uh, protein that is what gives bioluminescent critters their color. He had conjugated one of those to this, to this thing and expressed it in the surface of a membrane, put a hydrogen ion gradient across it, and it started driving this thing. This thing's a motor. It's a motor. It's a little motor. And that motor uh, is used to catalyze uh, the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. So he had a photo, a, a video, of this membrane with all these little motors spinning around with their green fluorescent proteins on it. It was, I blew my mind at the time, I'm sure. Uh, it's not that big a deal now, but um, it, was, it was pretty amazing still how the F1 portion is embedded in the membrane. This F1 portion uh, is, is the rotor, 
and it's driven by a hydrogen ion pump, uh, that electrochemical gradient uh, drives the cat catalysis of phosphorylation of the uh, of ADP to ATP. All right, so let's try to review. We get two ATP out of glycolysis. Uh, pyruvate comes out, enters the TCA cycle, uh, and all of these coenzymes that are made in the TCA cycle feed into the electron transport chain, uh, which gives us a whole bunch of ATP. All right, uh, we, we add all the ATP up, and the oxidative cleavage of, uh, of one molecule of glucose is going to give us a net of 36. Uh, only two of them come outside of the mitochondria where there's no oxygen. 34 are inside where we're using oxygen, consuming oxygen, releasing carbon dioxide, and uh, releasing water, giving us 36 ATP. That's the take-home message there. Beta oxidation, yeah. So beta oxidation, I'm going to probably skip this slide here uh, mostly, but it's basically just the taking of fatty acids and cleaving carbon fragments off of this to form acetyl-CoA, which feeds directly into the TCA cycle, okay? So you can carve two carbon fragments off of a long fatty acid chain iteratively. Every, you can, every two carbons can be cleaved off iteratively, that acetyl-CoA can also feed into the TCA cycle. That's how we can burn fat to make uh, energy, to make ATP, all right? Uh, lipid transport. Yeah, there's some other things I'm gonna, I want to talk about. Um, it, that is interesting, though. Yeah, so here is the genuine bottom line. The genuine bottom line. Um, here's the four terms, the, the glycolysis, glyconeogenesis, uh, glycogenesis, glyco, uh, uh, glycogenolysis up here. Uh, this is the carbohydrates go into uh, the, the glycolysis, get pyruvate, uh, kicks off CO2, goes into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA, this two-carbon fragment, is really uh, the currency, uh, the food that the mitochondria wants. And it's a pretty simple... It's a pretty simple uh, two-carbon fragment uh, so, uh, conjugated to this uh, coenzyme here. Uh, this can be fed by lipids. Uh, it can be fed by proteins. Right? We can take carbons off of proteins. Carbohydrate is the preferred method. Is the preferred method. And then go into TCA, electron transport, get a net of uh, between these two and the two from here. We get 36 per uh, molecule of glucose. All right. Proteins. Let's talk about nitrogen balance for a moment. Uh, there's 20 amino acids. Uh, there's about 140,000 proteins. Um, so you don't get the same bang for your buck from all the 20 amino acids. Uh, these are what are called the essential amino acids. The ones in orange are not synthesized by the body at all. You have to eat them in your diet. Luckily, it's pretty easy to find them. Uh, and then there are two that are insufficiently, uh, that are in, that are insufficiently produced. That means altogether there are 10 essential uh, amino acids. You have to get all 10 of those in your diet, uh, which is why it's a little hard for vegetarians to eat uh, nothing but Doritos. Okay. Uh, this is uh, one of the last ideas I wanted to get to. So the, the concept of nitrogen balance. I've been dancing around this topic uh, for the last several lectures. This is the, the notion of how much nitrogen your body's bringing in versus how much nitrogen you're losing. And we're going to, this is going to become important on Monday when we do the metabolic analysis lab. Okay. Um, so a positive nitrogen balance is when you're eating more nitrogen, a.k.a. protein, than is leaving the body via your urine and your feces, all right? So that's positive nitrogen balance. That happens to three groups of people. 
uh, babies, uh, infants or fetuses, mothers who are pregnant and are growing this uh, fetus, little kids who are getting bigger, and bodybuilders. Um, so people, anybody who's putting on mass, building muscle, is going to be in a positive nitrogen balance. All right? They're taking in more than they're excreting. They're using that. Remember, the, the renal threshold, that transport maximum of amino acids was really low, 65 milligrams per deciliter uh, uh, renal threshold in your blood, right? Uh, so uh, these people here are taking up more than they're, they're giving, giving off. People in negative nitrogen balance, um, this is where the excretion exceeds ingestion. This tends to be... Uh, this tends to be people uh, who are anorexic. Uh, they're not eating enough calories, and their body is burning protein for energy, uh, and it wants the carbon off the protein, and so it's giving off all these nitrogen-containing compounds. So they're excreting nitrogen, which is a bad deal. Uh, and of course, uh, people in uh, malnourish malnourishment is another example. These are related to one another, uh, basically voluntary, involuntary. And, and then people uh, who have some sort of muscle wasting disease, that's, uh, that's Lou Gehrig's right there. All right, last slide. Metabolic syndrome, um, we're gonna, that's what this talk on Monday is gonna be about. We'll talk about it more then, but I just wanna point out, I know I'm a minute over. Um, This metabolic syndrome is a suite of uh, disorders that are this, like this constellation of different uh, uh, clinical pathologies. We have central obesity, woo, uh, heart disease, atherosclerosis, hypertension, insulin resistance, low HDL or good cholesterol, uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia, like your triglycerides are way out of line. There, there are other aspects uh, to this. This insulin resistance travels along with uh, diabetes. 34% of the population, this is, this is old. These are old numbers here, 10 years ago. These numbers are probably higher now because this has been getting worse. So maybe 40% of the population 20 years of age and over meet the criteria for, uh, for metabolic syndrome. Damn. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's a huge drag on our economy. Medical costs are about $10,000 per person annually shared amongst us. So the, so the people in this classroom would be my guess. You don't have metabolic disorder, but you're paying taxes, and that tax money is going to deal with this problem right here. So even though you don't think you're spending $10,000 a year on your health care uh, that's related to metabolic syndrome, you are, though, because it's a, it's a national pandemic. It's all of our problems. It's all of our problems, even, even the healthy people. That's about $1 trillion per year in the U.S. alone. That's 7% of the U.S. GDP. 7%, that's like one in every $12, every $13 that is spent in the U.S. is spent on this problem right here. That's huge. And it's not just the United States. That's 1.5 billion people worldwide. 1.5 billion people worldwide. I think arguably you could say that this is the greatest health concern on the planet right now. <clears throat> Major problem. Major problem. Okay, there you go.